Bonnie and Clyde is now showing again in London's West End at the Garrick Theatre this time, having successfully completed a run at the Arts Theatre in 2022, which I was a massive fan of. So, today, I want to talk through the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there is a bit of ugly, of the new production to compare it to the previous one and also sort of stack it up against the other things showing right now in London's West End. I should note that I saw it on opening preview night, so there may well be a couple of tweaks and changes as the days and weeks go on. So with that said, let's talk through the production and through doing that, you'll start to understand the conclusion I'm going to come to at the end of what exactly I think is wrong with this new version, as well as the things that I do really like. The beginning of the show is quite significantly different to the original. I'm saying original here, obviously, meaning the arts version. Right off the bat, they've added some new dialogue at the start, talking about the bullets that passed through Clyde and hit Bonnie and how many the police fired and things like that. And this leads straight into the first song of the show, Picture Show, which previously was performed by child actors initially, a child version of Bonnie and a child version of Clyde, who would then transform into adult Bonnie and adult Clyde mid-song. I really liked this previous portrayal. It showed the passage of time really nicely nicely, and it sets some things up later in the show that we'll get to later. But now, it's just Francis Maley McCann playing Bonnie and Jordan Luke Gage playing Clyde, acting as younger versions of their actual characters. And I just don't think it works as well. It's sort of fine, like Francis's portrayal and Jordan's portrayal of those characters a couple years younger sort of sells, but I think in terms of sort of dramatic weight and meaning, I suppose, it just doesn't land as effectively as the previous staging did, in my opinion. You also notice straight away several things in Picture Show which are emblematic of changes they've made to the entire production at large. One is that they're using a little bit more video in the background now. So the Garrick Theatre has a fairly deep stage and on that back wall they essentially project a couple of different scenes as they go through. And there was still some projection stuff being done at the Arts Theatre but it didn't feel like it was as important really if at all. Whereas now they've leaned into that a little bit more. And they've also changed for example the moments where Clyde is meant to be being jailed and getting his picture taken and he's looking at the police officers there and going bang bang and doing all this sort of stuff to try and spook him and it was really effective previously and that just isn't in the new version. Clyde is just doing that in the middle of the stage with pretty much no one around him and I thought that was really ineffective compared to the previous staging, sadly. The production rolls along and you end up in a hair salon, which is very similar to what they did at the Arts Theatre. They've staged it pretty much the exact same way, but there are maybe three or four key components that are different now. One is that Blanche, who is Buck's partner, Buck being the brother of Clyde, is now played by Jodie Steele. And at first I was a little bit like, mm, I'm not sure she's quite getting to the heart of the Blanche humour that I really loved in the previous version, but it just took a little bit of warming up, and I think that then she really started nailing it, and I ended up loving her performance, especially towards the end of the show. Really fantastic stuff. Jodie Steele gets double thumbs up from me. You also, in this scene, have a moment where Buck has to hide from the police who come into the salon to look for him. And in the previous version, it was so funny because they basically wrap him up in a towel, and it's sort of the vibe of, like, put cucumbers on his eyes and they won't be able to tell it's him. Like, he's meant to look like one of the women getting his hair done and it was just really comedic previously and they just don't do that at all anymore instead he just hides behind a wall and he's not even that hidden and when the police are in the salon looking around they can see or they should be able to see him and granted like it's theater he's behind you i get it like you can stage these things and not have it be literally invisible to a character for them to not see it but it just didn't work like the previous version was so much funnier and i suspect this is something that they're going to change because it was a real moment in the previous version and i think they should bring it back the song they sing in the salon is you're going back to jail and this is a fun one because you get sort of solos from the other women that are in the salon getting their hair done i always really enjoy lauren jones's performance here she's the alternate for bonnie she also plays trish and she's just full of character she's fantastic but one of the new members of the cast is julie yamani and she plays bonnie's mum and also plays one of the women in the salon how do you even say that word salon 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 i don't know anyway as bonnie's mum i thought julie was fantastic and as part of the ensemble later in the show as well when the preacher's around and things like that julie is really fantastic but the way that she portrays the character who's getting her hair done 
just didn't work for me. She was pretty much unintelligible because of the accent that she was putting on. And I don't really get it because for the rest of the show, she's completely fine. It's just that one character in the hair salon that's just a little bit garbled, I would say right now. I don't think the humor contributed by that kind of silly voice she's putting on is enough to justify the lack of enunciation, the lack of clarity. Again, though, really easy fix. She can just do a different voice. She does it for the rest of the show and she's a blooming good singer. So I know she's capable of it. You also have a moment in the scene where one of the policemen is meant to be drinking some lemonade that she's handed by Blanche. And there's meant to be some comedy here because he's meant to drink it very slowly and kind of be looking her in the eyes almost as he does it. And the longer he drinks, the more it's like, Jesus Christ, are you done, man? Like what's going on here? But I just don't really feel like it landed particularly well in the new version, partially because I think he's a bit turned away from Blanche. And so it just doesn't feel like the focus that is the point of the comedy, or at least I thought was the point of the comedy previously, is in the right place. Like if right now I'm looking at you and I'm trying to kind of create some kind of tension and I'm going... and just holding it and being really weird, that's obviously gonna end up in a stage setting when it's obviously meant to be comedic, feeling like maybe there's some humor there. Whereas if I'm like, I feel like it doesn't really land in the same way. That said, the crowd liked it, but they were also Bonnie fans. So I don't know if they liked it because they knew they would like it or because they actually thought that it was being performed well. I don't know. Maybe I'm just nitpicking too much. The new preacher ends up getting his first appearance moments after this and he's played by Dom Hartley Harris and he is so good. I loved his performance. I really enjoyed Akko Mitchell in the arts version of Bonnie but there was a problem that I had with Akko's performance through the entire thing and it wasn't even really his fault which was quite sad. Basically there was something with the sound setup in the arts that just didn't work with Akko's voice. When he was belting and there's a lot of really kind of growly belting through the entire thing in preacher fashion his voice would kind of peak and the speakers just wouldn't sound good when they were blasting it out to everyone. It wasn't his voice, I don't think, that was the problem. I just don't think that they mixed it in the right way. And so it's no fault of Akko's, but now that Dom Hartley Harris is playing the preacher and it's in a different theater, that problem is gone completely. His voice sounds fantastic. He's got loads of character in his face. And I thought overall, he did a really, really good job. I will say, I think that there was some missed opportunity with the songs that the preacher sings. He's got two main songs. One is God's Arms Are Always Over. Open, which starts off more solemn and then turns into a much more upbeat kind of celebratory religious praise song. And you also have Made in America after the interval, which is maybe a little more serious and pointed, I suppose. But still, it's a group ensemble number and it's a lot of fun. And I feel like they could have staged these in a way to make them feel more fun. Like in the arts, you've got these dances that they do and it's sort of almost line dancey at parts. And it's just a good time, but it didn't feel like they elevated that good time in the Garrick, it was just sort of the same thing as before. And I just would have liked it to feel a bit more elevated now that it's at the Garrick. This brings us into the end of Act 1, which has Raise a Little Hell go straight into This World Will Remember Us. And I think in the arts theatre, this is one of the strongest endings to an Act 1 out of any show I've ever seen. Those two songs back to back are so phenomenal. And it was good at the Garrick. It was pretty damn similar to what they'd done before. Like there weren't a huge number of changes here with one very sort of small exception, I'd say, which is that the guard is now played by Robbie Scotcher. And there's a point where the guard is searching Bonnie and he basically pulls a lighter out from her leg. And Bonnie then gets past the guard and goes and delivers a gun to Clyde. The issue is the way that he acted, the lighter procurement was too small. It wasn't obvious enough. And so for someone that doesn't know the show, you're going to be looking at that scene, not understanding why he's searched her leg, found something, and then is happy with what he's found and then moves on. In fact, it might not have even been a lighter. It might have been a pack of cigarettes that he found. I can't remember because it was so hard to see what was happening. And previously, you really instantly hated the guard from that scene. Whereas this time around, I don't think he quite sold it in the way that I was hoping he would. But he's new to the role, so maybe this will improve. So we get into Act 2, and Act 2, I think, comes together a little bit more tightly than Act 1 did. I'm going to call out some of the main important changes I think they've made. One is there's a completely new scene with Bonnie's mum just before Bonnie ends up dying, essentially, right at the end of the show. Instead of having Bonnie visit her mum and try and give her money, Ted visits Bonnie's mum instead, and Bonnie's mum is sweeping up her porch, and so Ted, this police officer, comes and says, are you aware that your daughter is involved? 
involved in all of this stuff. And her mum pretty much says, yep, I know she's gonna die, but she's coming back here when she does, as in she wants to be buried here sort of vibes. And there's a line in there about how she just can't seem to keep her damn porch clean because all this dust keeps getting in. And I felt like they were trying to make it more rooted to the period and be like, yeah, guys, the dust bowl is a big deal. But I just didn't feel like it contributed to the show. Like Bonnie's mom not caring so much about her daughter seemingly or not being able to deal with it because life is so hard already or whatever is not that interesting unless you really pull the poignancy out of it and display that to the audience. And I think that's more apparent when it's Bonnie herself in a scene with her mother, but you never really see her mother break. You never really see her mother change her mind. You never see her mother go through any growth. She's just there sweeping. And so you kind of don't care about her that much at least. So I think that this scene fell a little flat. I guess they wanted to justify the addition of a porch. <laughs> also, in the previous version of the show, mid gunfight at the end, everything would stop and there'd be a moment of clarity where Clyde would see the child version of himself played by a child and the child would go through this little monologue saying how terrible all of this is and how all of this violence and anger gets mixed up and the whole whole mess is confusing. They shoot you and you shoot them. And adult Clyde then fires his gun, ending that part of the scene and sort of killing child him in the process, symbolically at least, and thus continuing with the gunfight and fighting till the bitter end when he's killed. But there are no children actors in the new version of the show, so there's no one for adult Clyde to shoot at. And so he gives that monologue to the audience this time and then just shoots out into the audience. And it is nowhere near as effective. It was so dramatic, in my opinion, previously, and I saw a Festoon production of Bonnie as well, and they did this so well. But having the child there walking up to Clyde as he's holding the gun, Clyde in his head is having this awful debate between whether he listens to his child self here, whether he maybe has a moment of doubt, or whether he just needs to keep barreling on down this impossible road. And it gets to it, and it gets so painful what the child is saying that he just ends it all, shoots the child version of him and then keeps on going to his demise. It's fantastic and it's gone now. It means so much less for him to be looking out into the audience and just go, it gets mixed up, the whole mess, bang. Like sure, I like the idea that you're trying to give him one final moment of humanity before he goes down in history as this murderous killer. But when you put the child in front of the gun and it's him and he's walking away from his past and his youth and his innocence in so much more apparent a manner, it was brilliant before I thought, I don't particularly like the way they do it now. And lastly, you have... And lastly, before I get onto the meat and potatoes of the good and the bad here, they've added some stuff between Blanche and Bonnie, kind of illustrating their relationship a little bit and having Blanche sort of try and convince her that this is a bad idea and things like that. And I like what this does for Blanche's character because it makes her a little bit less like a willing accomplice who in the previous version of the show simply ended up following Buck when Buck decided that he had to leave to go and follow Clyde. Instead now it shows that she's going along with it but the reluctance is much more palpable throughout to the very end. And they've also changed a little bit the way that when Buck dies, Blanche reacts to all that stuff. And I liked this. It does feel like it's maybe a little heavy handed at times because you're getting towards the end of the show and suddenly you're trying to get through some sort of emotional navigation with these two characters that haven't had a huge amount of chance to open up to each other previously in the show. They just don't like each other. But still, I think overall, this is a net positive for the show. And then the show ends and it's wonderful. Bonnie and Clyde is such a good production. So is it better or worse than it used to be? Well, there are two things that I think are extremely easy fixes that I'd like them to make. And then there's one that is a more difficult fix, but I think is the biggest problem with the show. And it's the thing that prevents it from really excelling in the Garrick Theatre compared to what it was able to achieve in the arts. The two small fixes, these are very, very small, okay? Like tiny minor gripes. First off, the lighting tech who's doing the spotlights, or there might be two lighting techs, up at the very top of the theatre has their hand go in front of the beam numerous times through the show. Like I'm talking like 30, 40 times. And 
so on the boxes at the sides of the theater, you see their hands shadow mid dialogue, mid scene, etc. And it's really distracting. Anyone in the grand circle or basically anyone outside of the stalls is going to notice this, I think. And so there were so many moments where a character would be having an emotional moment on the stage. And my peripheral vision would be being pulled to the fact that the lighting tech was fiddling with the spotlight and it was causing these shadows to appear. Super easy fix, I would imagine. The other is that there is now a mesh curtain that they use, semi-transparent curtain that they use to sort of segment off different areas of the stage. It's just to create depth so that you have an indoor area, maybe like the inside of a house and an outdoor area, which might be the front of the house with the porch. And this works okay. I don't particularly like it personally, but it's there to try and make better use of the space. They also have the doors that they had at the Arts Theatre back again this time, except instead of being one continuous wall this time around, it's kind of split. You've got the two edge sections and then you have a central garage door style section, which is offset a bit from those outside walls. So there's a gap between them. And you can also see through the bullet holes on the door. And the top of the door feels like it's maybe a bit more transparent than it was before. What this means is that in certain scenarios, you'll have stuff happening front of stage, but you'll end up distracted because you can see them setting up the next scene behind the door because it's not a complete blackout wall. Like if I can see a character's hat kind of bobbing back and forth behind a crack in a wall during a scene, that's going to distract a bit from what's happening front of stage. And normally in theater in the West End, this is paid so much attention to. Like even in things that don't really review particularly well, like I can think, for example, of in Bad Cinderella. They had so much stuff happening at the back of the stage there behind the structures that they created. And you don't notice that stuff. You don't see people shifting their outfit or whatever because it's not meant to be on stage at that time. But in this... It is on stage because you can see it. I did have a side view, so perhaps this is less of a problem if you're facing front on, but I just don't understand why they didn't line things up so that it was the same as how it was at the arts, which seemed to solve the problem. I don't get it. And this all contributes in combination to the biggest problem that the show has. And that's simply that it gets lost in the stage. The arts theater is tiny. It's wonderful. It's this little dinky theater. It's not got a huge number of seats and the stage itself is pretty small. As such, when they produced Bonnie for it, they didn't need to really do a huge amount with the set in order for it to sell the scenes that they were trying to portray. Now though, that is just no longer the case. The Garrick stage goes back really damn far. Here's an example from The Drifter's Girl, which I actually managed to see on its closing night, so I saw it as recently as I could have done before Bonnie opened. And you can see the stage goes back a really long way compared to the arts. It's also wider and it's taller, and the theatre itself, where the seating is, is bigger. And this means that there is a lot more set that needs to be filled. And instead of filling it with things in the new Bonnie production, they've decided to go with some projections on the back wall, which is really far away. And like I said, this mesh curtain to try and break the stage up a little bit. And that's about it. There aren't any particularly big new props that they've added. They haven't gone in the festoon direction and created the bathtub on this kind of structure that you have to climb up to. It's just the same stuff as before. The bathtub is just a bathtub. The porch is just a porch. The gas station is just a sign. I think the only real addition to mention is they've got now two of these pillars that do absolutely nothing to feel like the stage is broken up or spaced in a different way. And so it just feels vacuous. And there were so many moments throughout the show. Like, for example, pretty early on, Bonnie and Clyde are outside and then Bonnie runs to the car to get in. And it's meant to be this really cute little moment. Poor Frances Maley McCann. It's not like she's tiny like it's not like she's three foot five or something but she was running for five minutes to get to that car because the stage is so long it completely changes the feeling of these scenes because you're sort of waiting for her to get there almost obviously i'm exaggerating a bit but this is a problem throughout the entire show and i want to use drifter's girl again here as a reference for ways that you can solve this problem super easily without needing necessarily to have massive props taking up space. In The Drifter's Girl, they lit the floor in a very deliberate manner to section off certain areas of the stage that would be dead space 
and create areas that were your focal point that you would feel like was the main stage and elsewhere could be ignored. It wasn't just lights on the floor that contributed to this. They also had light poles that would slide in and some sort of semi walls and things like that. On top of this, they had platforms on the floor that weren't anything special. It would literally just be a rectangle and maybe another rectangle on top. And so you would get the feeling of this tiny little pyramid that once again would draw your focal point of the stage and that would be that. You wouldn't be focused so much on what was off those pyramids because obviously they elevate the character on them and they draw your focus. Bonnie doesn't have any any of that at any moment. It's this really deep space and a lot of the time the whole depth is visible. They don't always have those walls there. And so you've just got so much room that they're dealing with and you compare this to the arts which was so much more enclosed and it felt so much more believable. They felt so much more at home in that space. The kind of moments where they run over to the wall and would maybe look in a mirror that was on the wall or grab a ukulele off the wall or, or whatever it might have been. They had these kind of bits of set dressing on the sides that they would interact with from time to time there and that all felt like one and the same space that they were occupying when they were in the middle of the stage but now it doesn't feel like that it feels miles away and so i think that they've tried to say well bonnie was really successful at the arts theater so let's not fix what wasn't broken and they've gone well the arts theater stage was maybe four meters by four meters let's say just hypothetically and now it's six meters by nine meters maybe let's just expand the spacing. Let's just have everyone stand a bit further away from each other and kind of spread things out more to fill the space. But it doesn't work because then people are miles away from each other. Everything feels really fragmented and it doesn't feel like that intimate, small story that it felt like before. If they were using the space in new ways, fantastic, but they're not. They've just taken something small and expanded it. And that means that you see the gaps in between. That's my biggest gripe with Bonnie and Clyde. That's the ugly that I think that they need to work on or I really hope they work on at least. But to be clear, this show is still very good. It's still one of my favorite shows in the West End. I will be going back to see it, especially once they've finished previews, just to see if any of these concerns have been addressed. I'll update you if they have, so subscribe. And it's still something that I highly recommend to everyone. If you haven't seen it, I really, really think Bonnie and Clyde is worth a watch. If there's anything you'd like me to review next, then please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in that Bonnie follow-up video sometime soon.